Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to this week's webinar. My name is Emily, I'm from the Fertility Network team. And this evening we're joined again by nutritious, nutritionist Sarah Trimble to discuss how to stay healthy during lockdown. Obviously lockdown is an incredibly tough time, especially if you're trying to conceive. And some of you may be trying to maintain a healthy diet that can improve your chances, or some of you may be trying to reach targets for treatment, whatever your case, the last thing we want to do is make you feel guilty for maybe indulging here and there. So rather than do that, we've invited Sarah Trimper to talk about food that can be both comforting and nutritious, as well as some lifestyle changes. Hopefully this will be great for your fertility health, your mental health, your immune system. Um, so after Sarah's presentation, we'll also be talking about a new four week group that we're launching later this month. And we'll also open up the Q&A's. So if you do have any questions, just pop them in the Q&A box down below and we'll go through these at the end. So I'll pass over to you now, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Hi, my name is Sarah Trimble. Um, I'm a nutritional therapist based in Belfast in Northern Ireland. I, um, over the years, I've done quite a lot of work with the Fertility Network and um, helping to advise people who are trying to conceive or going through fertility treatment um, about the best dietary and lifestyle approaches that can really support and improve um, your fertility and reproductive health. Um, so as Emily said, we're really going to focus today on um, recognizing some of the real um, issues with lockdown, how it could be affecting your health and your reproductive health quite negatively. And we're going to key in on some maybe possible benefits um, of uh, the lockdown and how that might be providing us with some small opportunities to maybe look at ways we can uh, take advantage of these changes and um, maybe have some positive Im impact on our reproductive health. So I'm gonna start to share my slides here, one second. And we'll get started with that. So as I said, we're just really gonna focus this evening on how to stay healthy during lockdown. As Emily mentioned, we're going to have a little bit of Q&A afterwards. Um, so any questions that you might have that you, uh, with regard to um, nutrition, diet and fertility, even if they're not at all related to my slides, feel free to um, share those um, during while I'm talking and we're going to go through those afterwards. So just to focus on how to stay healthy during lockdown, um, and just a quick recap. Um, not sure it's news to anyone, but of the ways that lockdown has potentially impacted our health. Um, it's negatively impacted the health of the nation in a number of ways. Um, diet um, is a big um, area where a lot of us feel we've been impacted. Maybe we're comfort eating more. Um, good dietary habits might have gone out the window. Um, we might be comfort eating a bit more, which might have led to some weight gain. Um, increased alcohol consumption. A lot of statistics are coming through indicating that increased alcohol consumption is a big factor we're experiencing during lockdown. Um, stress, very obviously, um, the whole nation is, is experiencing higher levels of stress and anxiety, but um, especially for those couples trying to conceive, undergoing fertility treatment who might have found their treatment has been paused. Um, they're now um, you know, further down a waiting list for treatment. Those, that base level of anxiety that everyone's experiencing is just so much more exaggerated. Um, and we're going to look at ways that we can maybe um, focus on how um, lifestyle measures might balance out the, the, the negative impact of that stress. And we're also going to look at the importance of sleep um, uh, for fertility, but also recognizing that uh, this lockdown um, has had a very negative impact on sleep patterns of the nation. Um, and um, I'm not going to pretend that lockdown is a real positive experience. But I do want to factor in and talk about some of the small um, positives that we might be able to glean from lockdown to changes in our routine that we can maybe turn around into positives for our health and um, our reproductive health and lifestyle changes. So I wanted to talk first about you know, lockdown comfort eating and weight gain. Um, I work quite a lot with um, uh, couples who are trying to conceive um, maybe have target weights um, that they're trying to reach before they begin um, IVF cycles or fertility treatments. And I've spoken to quite a lot of um, individuals over the last few months, six months or so, who were doing quite well with weight loss, 
and then found lockdown came along and comfort eating came in and they found that a lot of their weight loss um, had been sort of negated and they'd gained back any weight that they'd lost or um, maybe they were doing quite well in their normal day-to-day -day routine um, and had a really what they felt was a really good balanced lifestyle with exercise and diet and lockdown just came along and uh, and has, has really sort of um, negated again a lot of the benefits um, and a lot of the improvements that they've made. So um, the, the statistic that we can find is that about 40% of it, 48 percent of people report having put on, on weight during lockdown. So if you are feeling quite negative, if you have put on weight um, as a result of the changes to your lifestyle, don't feel that you're alone because about, you know pretty much half of us have all put on weight. So it's a very, very common reaction to, to what we've been experiencing over the last few months. Um, one of the main obvious uh, reasons for this is because comfort eating and baking is one of the possible causes of, of weight gain during lockdown. A lot of us have been eating a lot more sugar, um, um, sweet foods, and baking became a real kind of like pastime that I think got us through a lot of the early um, earlier pandemic, the early lockdown was like the banana bread. I've got a photo of the banana bread there because that became a real thing on social media. Everyone was making banana bread, banana bread. And it's very natural that when things are tough, we feel like we deserve a treat. And in the end, we do. We do deserve something to make us feel better. Um, but I wanted to really key in early on in the, in the session on the, the, the role of sugar and why sugar might have a real negative impact on our weight, but also our fertility health. Um, because I think not enough people are really aware of the negative relationship between um, sugar intake and our reproductive health. So increased sugar and also alcohol consumption are what I would call empty calories. So it's calories that don't leave you feeling full if anything, maybe leave you feeling more hungry again. So you're consuming all these calories, but you're not getting satisfied. And as a result, uh, that can really lead to weight gain, these empty calorie intake. Um, working from home can lead to weight gain as we constantly have food available. A lot of us have been working from our dining room table. So it's very easy to pop into the kitchen regularly for a biscuit or for, for an, a little treat. Um, increasing snacking and reducing time between meals. Um, we're, a lot of us are actually also naturally moving around less. If you think about the lack of a commute, um, even the amount of walking that some of us do around our offices or places of work, um, it can really, um, by, by having to work from home, we could be really reducing naturally the amount of, of, of exercise we're doing. So how can sugar, sugar impact our fertility? Um, and I really wanted, as I said, I really wanted to focus on this early because in my opinion, sugar, a, a diet that's high in sugar is probably as negative for the body when you're trying to conceive as smoking or um, a high alcohol intake. Um, so sugar on its very basic level, empty calories, which can really promote weight gain. Um, and this weight gain um, for women, um, especially if we're putting on weight, it can actually um, promote hormonal imbalances in women because fat cells um, can actually produce um, hormones and they can produce estrogen. And this can very much contribute to hormonal imbalances. So if you're a woman who's struggling with um, hormonal imbalances in general, um, eating a lot of sugar and putting on weight can have a very negative impact on that. Um, a higher sugar intake can also negatively impact fertility in both men and women, um, but it would probably have the most significant impact on women who have PCOS. Um, women with PCOS um, often suffer from a state which is called insulin resistance, which means that after they eat something which is very sugary, their blood sugar spikes um, really rises very high and they will have an exaggerated response to those sugary foods compared to um, someone who is not insulin resistant, who doesn't have PCOS. And as we'll see, that can actually um, negatively impact our fertility in a number of ways. So um, when we eat um, sugar or also um, I would classify under the sugar umbrella any like white carbohydrate based foods like crackers um, made with like white flour or white bread um, from the supermarket. Um, these lead to the production of when our blood sugar spikes after we eat these foods, our body produces insulin to help to manage those blood sugar levels. So in women with PCOS, this insulin um, production is exaggerated and their blood sugar goes very high, their insulin levels go very high. And this leads to hormonal imbalances. 
because even though insulin is used by our body to manage blood sugar levels, it can also um, interfere with our sex hormone production. And in women with PCOS, this can lead to like excess testosterone. So insulin has the ability to interfere with our, with our fertility and our reproductive health. Um, in both men and women, um, higher blood sugar levels. So this is even women without PCOS. Um, there's been a lot of good research in recent years looking at the role of high blood sugar and high insulin levels. And we know that higher levels of blood sugar and insulin um, as a result of a high a sugar diet or a very high carb diet is linked to poor egg quality for women and poor sperm quality in men. Um, and these um, it, women and men who had higher blood sugar and higher insulin levels were also found to have poor outcomes um, when they went for assisted conception, such as IVF. So um, these high blood sugar and insulin levels could really be negatively directly impacting your, your reproductive health. Um, and as just that sort of little bit of a cycle, this little picture that I have on the side, just to show you that sort of um, blood sugar becomes a bit of a, um, a vicious cycle that they can, can be quite hard to, to break out of. If we eat um, like carbohydrates or sugar, our blood sugar increases, we get increased insulin secretion, that leads to increased fat storage, that then leads to low blood sugar, we get low energy and mood swings because our blood sugar drops, and then we get more carb cravings, and because we've got the carb cravings, we eat more sugar. So this kind of sugar addiction cycle is very, very vicious, and it's about trying to break out of that. Um, so how could you quit sugar during lockdown? It seems like quite a difficult thing to do, um, but I think it's something that's really, really, really possible. Um, it's important to kind of understand that sugar cravings can be tough to break, but it takes 10 days to break the sugar addiction cycle. So we would call this almost like a sugar detox where you remove all sugar and sugary foods um, and refine carbohydrates out of the diet for 10 days. Um, if you are a real sugar addict, those the first seven days are very, very difficult. The first week, um, it's difficult because your cravings for sugar can be very, very extreme and you might find yourself being a bit lower in energy. But um, uh, by the middle of the second week, day 10, you will find that your sugar cravings are really normalizing and you'll also find energy levels normalizing. Um, treat, uh, treats like your sugary foods. I think we have to also get out of the mindset that there's something that we can be eating every single day. Should be treats we shouldn't be having every day. Um, I would say a maximum of two to three times a week. Um, not every day, like for example, maybe a treat midweek and um, maybe something on Saturday and something on Sunday um, and keeping it to that real minimum. Um, and also maybe look at swapping your baking to healthy baking options. When we're baking, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, cakes and biscuits that we're cooking, we're baking. Um, so if you do find baking quite therapeutic and a really nice hobby to have um, during lockdown, then we can look at maybe healthier options for that. Um, and again, I think this is where we could really key in on a, on a positive of lockdown is that when we're working from home, when we're, in ho we're at home a lot more, we have actually got more control over our food environment than maybe when we're in work, where maybe um, colleagues are bringing in biscuits and cakes and encouraging us to have something or you know, bringing us a treat over to our desk. You know, in our house, we control the food environment. So if we can remove temptation from the house, we can really break this sugar kind of addiction cycle and this comfort food eating cycle. So just a few ideas for healthy baking. Um, um, I'm from Northern Ireland and we're really big into making like wholemeal breads, like wheaten breads, soda breads, oat breads, um, and it's something that's really easy to make. You can sort of have it in the, in, in the oven within like half an hour, just mixing everything together. And it's something that's, um, you know, a really great basis for like a nice balanced meal. Um, I also would suggest that, you know, if you have time on your hands and you enjoy baking, um, you know, lockdown is a really good time to think about maybe mastering proper sourdough bread. Um, sourdough bread is not only really delicious, um, it's actually healthier for us than other types of bread um, because of the, the natural sourdough process. Um, it's less likely than other breads to cause blood sugar spikes and insulin release, which we know is not actually very good for our fertility. So, um, you know, learning how to make sourdough bread is a real positive 
um, for our general um, diet and wellness, but also could be pos a real positive in helping to bring down blood sugar levels and bring down insulin levels as well. Um, another thing I really like to make are like healthy crackers or oat cakes. Um, and you can make those from scratch. So they're perfect to have if you do want to have a healthy snack. And again, you know, maybe if you generally are going for like a, a, a biscuit or something sweet with a cup of tea or coffee mid-morning or mid-afternoon, maybe swap into something like, uh, you know, an oat cake um, or homemade oat cakes. That's a real good alternative and a good swap. Um, and even if you do bake something sweet, um, I know I was baking quite a bit um, like during the first lockdown last year. But what I would do is kind of after maybe my husband and I had had a treat on a Sunday and on a Saturday, um, the rest that we had left over, because there's just the two of us, I would either have frozen it or I would have brought it to a neighbour who I knew was maybe shielding and wasn't going out so much. And that was a really lovely thing um, to do. So as I said, um, think of your sweet treats as treats so that they're not happening every day. And as I said, if you do bake a lot, maybe try to incorporate these healthier ideas for baking um, and healthy comfort foods. And as I said, it's quite normal to feel like we need these treats. Um, we're not eating out in restaurants as much. Um, we don't really have much to look forward to at the moment, <laughs> nothing much planned. Um, but can we look at comfort food in a different way and think about foods that are possibly healthy, but also very, very comforting um, and make us feel kind of like, uh, you feel good essentially. Um, so if I'm thinking about what a healthy comfort food is, I would say stay away from cold foods or salads. If you think about it, that cold food going into your tummy doesn't really have the same comforting element as nice warm food. Um, and another sort of area of food which is really comforting is like bowl food. So like food that you can maybe eat in a bowl um, with one hand, maybe with like a spoon. Um, so food you eat in big bowls like curries, vegetable stews, chili con carne, um, soups, Thai noodle broth. It's all comforting and actually really tasty. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, eating foods like curries, tagines, where we're putting in lots of nice warming spices. It's not only kind of real good comfort food, but it's um, really good for our, our fertility and reproductive health because a lot of the spices you're using are actually really good antioxidants which protects our reproductive health really well. Um, so think about these foods that, yes, they might be kind of like comfort food, like a curry and rice, but maybe make it healthier by making it at home, maybe serving it with brown rice instead of white rice, just to get a real healthy spin. Um, one of my favorites is like Mexican food, but like quite healthy um, Mexican food. So maybe I'll make like um, tacos with white fish, like cod or hick and all my spices um, and maybe some black beans but I'll make like a homemade guacamole and a homemade salsa. So it's a really nice, healthy meal, um, but it kind of feels a bit like a treat as well, like something I would get in a restaurant. Um, and another one that I think is really um, great comfort food, like kind of going back to sort of childhood comfort food um, would be um, beans on toast, but I would buy like low sugar beans and a lot of the companies um, like Heinz and even supermarkets are doing own brands, which are sweetened with stevia a really good natural sweetener. So, um, you know, they're much healthier. They're a really good, like high protein um, meal, high fiber meal. And having those beans on sourdough toast is like a much healthier option than having it on your, your, your general like white bread. So just to have we maybe reassess what our comfort food would be um, and, and watching out for our sugar intake. And also when, um, when our routine changes, it's actually a good time to try and make positive changes. And as much as I've talked about um, removing sugar from the diet or removing those treats from the diet, um, I think it's also important when we remove something to always look at how we could maybe um, things that we can actually bring into the diet and introduce and focusing on the health benefits of those as well, rather than just kind of um, making lots of foods forbidden. We're also focusing on new foods that we can maybe introduce in. Um, and the, the the psychology of habit change and changing habits, um, which is actually quite a difficult thing to do, says that actually in times that our routine has changed quite significantly, it's actually much easier to introduce new habits because we're in a very new environment um, and um, it's easier for us to kind of break 
old habits and bring on new habits during these kind of changes of environment, changes of routine. Um, so um, I said a positive of lockdown is that we might have more time than ever to devote to cooking, um, especially at the weekend when we're not really going anywhere or doing anything. Um, so I said, why not spend the time making um, more positive changes? Um, so focusing maybe on increasing your vegetable intake and trying out new recipes that you don't usually have time for, such as vegetable stews or curries. Um, but if you're one of those people who actually find that they've got less time during lockdown to make positive changes, um, you can still eat healthfully and maybe make some of these positive changes, like things like stir fries, um, one pan tray baked dinners, where you maybe bake everything in the one pan together. There's lots of great um, tray baked recipes you'll find online. Um, you know, are really quick, healthy dinners, or even using your um, a slow cooker to make stews and curries. So there's definitely opportunities for us to make some positive changes. Um, and I really also want to talk about um, alcohol intake um, during lockdown. Um, there's a lot of really um, sort of astounding statistics about how alcohol intake has increased during lockdown. Um, one in three people claim that their consumption has increased. I saw a statistic in the news today saying that in January this year compared to January last year, um, our, our, our alcohol consumption had like increased by 26%. We were buying like 26% more alcohol from the supermarkets. Um, and I guess there's a various number of reasons why alcohol consumption has gone up um, over the past year. A lot of us um, who maybe don't have to commute because we can work from home, maybe find that we can have a drink most nights of the week because we don't have to drive the next day. So we're not worried about that sort of um, the negative of possibly drinking and, and then still having some alcohol in our system the next morning. Um, Bars and restaurants are closed, which you think would lead to less alcohol consumption. But if you think about it, when we're serving ourselves at home, we're very um, less likely to measure our alcohol consumption, measure our, you know, our glass of wine or gin and tonic. Um, so we can end up actually consuming more than we would if we were regularly going out for dinner and um, to bars or restaurants. Um, so a lot of people use alcohol as a stress management um, technique. Um, or for women especially, women are more, much more likely to use alcohol to reduce stress or because they're stressed or had a hard day um, compared to men. And also, I say there's also like much more availability because we're at home all the time um, and also reinforcement from social media. I think during the first lockdown, there was an awful lot of like um, memes and, you know, kind of jokes on social media about drinking at like 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I think that kind of reinforces sometimes our habits and making us maybe sort of reach for um, a drink much, much more often. Um, so I know anyone who's listening, you, you're not really sort of unfamiliar with the fact that alcohol is negative for your reproductive health and your fertility. We all know that. But I just wanted to highlight some of the reasons uh, why and, and how alcohol um, consumption can, can negatively impact your fertility just so you're informed. And I think sometimes having the information and knowing the reasons why is a bit more motiva helping, um, is motivating and helping us to stop, um, stop drinking so much because we understand how exactly it could negatively impact our bodies. Um, so alcohol consumption depletes our folate levels. And we're all very aware that it's folate um, or folic acid, as it's sometimes known, is really, really key, the key nutrient for, for female reproductive health. But it also has um, a role in, in male fertility as well. It's probably just as important for male fertility as for women um, because it actually helps the production of um, DNA. And um, as we know, um, both your egg cells, female egg cells and male sperm cells are, um, are, are the source of DNA for conception. Um, alcohol consumption can promote hormonal imbalances in women um, so by impacting on the liver, it can actually lead to higher levels of estrogen in the bloodstream that promotes hormonal imbalances because our liver is also the source of um, uh, estrogen detoxification in the body. So an imbalance of estrogen is known to be a driving factor in endometriosis. Um, another reason why alcohol consumption is not fab when we're trying to conceive is it can lead to weight gain, again, because the empty calories. Just I've got a little list here just outlining the number of calories in sort of a, a bottle of beer 
um, a red glass of red wine, the gin and tonics, if you think about it in an evening when maybe we're in the, in the house having a few drinks, it's very easy to add an extra 500, 600 calories onto your daily intake um, without actually filling you up because it's a, there, there are those empty calories. Um, alcohol consumption also leads to production of free radicals in the body. Um, free radicals are classified as unstable molecules that can damage our cells, including our DNA. So if we just talked about a few seconds ago how DNA production and healthy DNA is really important for conception. Alcohol can specifically um, lead to the production of these free radicals that could be damaging for our DNA. Um, so just to have a little bit more of a chat about this, alcohol, DNA and reproduction. Um, anything that results in free radical production in our body is bad news for fertility. Um, reproduction is essentially the combining of the DNA from an egg and a sperm. Um, and free radicals can damage DNA, potentially interfering with conception. Um, and sperm are even more vulnerable to DNA damage than egg cells. Some um, people that work within the reproductive health industry would refer to sperm as essentially DNA with a tail. So a sperm is a very kind of basic cell. It doesn't have, it's not very complex. Um, so the head of the sperm is really just filled with our DNA. Um, and then the, the tail is just to help the sperm move. So if you imagine sperm and eggs are very, very vulnerable to, to, da to the DNA damage. Um, and that's just a little bit of a diagram that shows you really what we're trying to achieve with conception is the DNA from the sperm, the DNA from the egg combining, and that is conception. So we really want to key in on how we can achieve healthy DNA in these cells. Um, the higher your alcohol intake, the more free radicals are produced. And actually, um, it is much more healthy to drink moderately across the week um, and spread your units of alcohol across the week rather than have a binge drinking session of alcohol um, one or two days a week because those binge sessions will actually really promote um, this free radical production, which can be very, very damaging um, to our cells. Um, so how can we address alcohol consumption during lockdown? Um, try alcohol-free alternatives. There's a lot of really good alcohol-free um, products on the market and the market keeps growing. It's become a very trendy area. Um, a lot of younger adults and millennials um, actually prefer these alcohol-free alternatives. So there's a huge, huge market. Um, there's alcohol-free beers, which in my opinion, a lot of them taste really good, um, or alcohol-free gins. Um, I'm not such a fan, but even um, um, drinks like kombucha, um, lots of kind of more grown up alcohol-free drinks are available on the market. So there's definitely something you can have sort of in the evening or with your food, if you're maybe having a, like a, a curry and you want a nice beer, um, but you don't necessarily have to turn to an alcoholic uh, version. Um, and what would be a positive of lockdown? And again, I know there's not many and we're maybe like grasping at straws, but um, I also feel that if you are trying to conceive and you're maybe struggling with social pressures um, to drink um, under normal circumstances, your friends would encourage you to drink alcohol when you go out and you maybe don't feel like telling them um, your reasons for not wanting to drink alcohol because we're not allowed to socialize. We can't eat out in restaurants or bars. You maybe are free from those kind of social obligations where you feel that you have to drink along with friends or family. Um, if you find you're struggling and you find it's quite hard to break the cycle, again, a bit like sugar, um, trying to have an alcohol-free month and break the habit that you've formed around drinking alcohol can be really, really positive. Um, I think when you do those kind of like alcohol-free months, that 30 days, a lot of people do in January, although I think much less people did it this year, just uh, under current circumstances, you realize where you've broken, you can help to break the cycle where you're maybe having a drink when you don't even really want it or need it. Um, and so then you can really significantly reduce your intake. Um, Obviously, when you're actively trying to conceive, active alcohol should be avoided completely, especially for women. However, moderate consumption of alcohol at all other times shouldn't cause a problem. Um, I would encourage people to try and have two to three alcohol-free days a week. And if you are going to have a drink, one of the best options is actually your red wine, which is really rich in antioxidants. So those antioxidants are really good for helping to protect um, our body against the damage of free radicals. Um, red wine, another real positive of red wine is it's been shown to actually feed the good bacteria in our gut. And it's a really emerging area of research 
but we're starting to understand that the good bacteria in our gut play a really important role in hormone balance and could play a real role in um, reproductive health, especially for women with PCOS. So um, that's just a little bit of an interesting area. If you are going to have a drink, try and have red wine. Um, so lockdown and stress. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you need to stress less or that you need to stop being stressed because I think this year in particular has been one of the most challenging in terms of stress and anxiety. You know, even for people who don't usually find themselves stressed or down or anxious, I think it's been so pervasive that it's, it's been very, very difficult to kind of get those stress levels under control. Um, and I chose this kind of little kind of picture because I thought it was true. It's like, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell everyone to stop stressing. What I wanted to focus on um, this evening is ways that kind of lifestyle measures can actually help to balance out um, the, the physical effects of stress and actually reduce the damage that stress might be having to our, our reproductive health and our health in general. Um, so figures show that in the three months leading up to September 2020, so just last autumn, um, 6 million people in England were prescribed antidepressants. That is the highest figure on record. So a lot of us are struggling with mood um, and, and stress and anxiety. Um, so never before have so many people been feeling intense anxiety and stress all at the same time. It's very, very difficult to escape this. Um, and why is lockdown so stressful? Um, for the obvious reasons, um, the news is very negative at the moment. We're all worried about ourselves, our family members, and we feel like we maybe lack control over the situation we're in. There's very little we can do about lockdown and about everything that's going on um, you know, in our country. Um, also lack of social interaction. It's a big one for a lot of people. Um, a lot of us are stuck inside, missing our usual social interactions with family, friends and colleagues. Um, you all know that feeling of well-being that you have after an evening out with friends or you know, an afternoon like having your Sunday lunch with family. Um, you know, it's a, such an amazing de-stressor. And the reason it's such an amazing de-stressor is because um, social interaction stimulates a hormone called oxytocin, which is sometimes given the name of the cuddle hormone. Um, and oxytocin really enhances our feelings of well-being. Um, and it actually um, can block the, the, the stimulation of stress hormones. So the more we have oxytocin kind of circulating around our body, we can actually block the, the release of stress hormones as well. Um, and apparently meeting in person, having some like very nice kind of proper social interaction, eye contact, um, hugging is much more effective at stimulating oxytocin than interacting online, which doesn't have the same impact um, with the, the stimulation of oxytocin. And as I said in the introduction, fertility treatment issues for a lot of us on here, um, maybe we've had treatment delayed, or cancelled and you add those stresses on on top of everything else you maybe don't have the same support network as usual and um, you know stress just becomes a, a real snowball effect with all these um, negative impacts so how does stress impact fertility um, and I know the, the relationship between stress and fertility can be a bit of a catch-22 because when we understand that stress is negative for our fertility and our reproductive health then we can become stressed, um, even more stressed because we are stressed and we start to worry about being worried and because we know that it's maybe negatively impacting our fertility. But again, I just want to like, focus tonight on some real positives and ways that we can maybe make lifestyle changes and physical changes that can actually bring down our stress levels, even if we're kind of still getting these stressful cues from the environment. Um, we can actually think of stress as nature's contraceptive because it causes a perfect storm of a hormonal imbalances that can impact our fertility. Tell, it essentially, stress essentially tells our body that now is not the time to conceive. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a number of ways that stress can negatively impact um, our hormone balance and our fertility. Um, cortisol, which is the body's main stress hormone, can really lead to higher levels of prolactin release in women. So that negatively impacts female fertility. Um, chronic stress leads to reduced levels of a hormone produced in the adrenal glands called DHEA. And DHEA is actually known to enhance fertility in both men and women. In fact, some fertility clinics, some very advanced fertility clinics in the States 
actually supplement and measure DHEA levels in people that are having fertility treatment at those clinics. Um, stress hormones can also negatively impact thyroid function, which is essential for healthy conception and pregnancy for women. Um, it also blocks melatonin production. So melatonin would be our sleep hormone, but as you'll see a bit later, we're going to talk about how it has a key role in fertility. Um, and it also, stress also raises our blood sugar and insulin levels. So as we talked about very early on when we were talking about like the sugar intake and comfort eating, um, these high blood sugar and insulin levels are associated with poor sperm and egg quality and reduced conception during assisted conception. So just to give you a bit of an outline, these are all the ways that stress can, can negatively impact our, our health. But how do we address the stress? I think sometimes when we're in the middle, like if you think of it as a storm, it's that we're in the middle of the eye of the storm and there's not much we can do about those external factors that are causing the stress, but there are things that we can change that will actually reduce um, the impact of stress in our body and protect our body from these negative impacts of stress. Um, I said, don't be stressed because your stress is going to become a vicious cycle. Be kind to yourself and accept that you might be more anxious and stressed and down the normal and it's a very normal uh, reaction to everything we've been going through this last year. I think I was talking to someone a few weeks ago and they said, well, if, if there's someone who isn't stressed out by what's happening over the last few months um, and year, then there's something wrong with them because, you know, it's, it's our natural reaction to the, to the situation. Do you recognize if you need professional help, for example, if your levels of stress and anxiety have snowballed and, um, you know, you're having panic attacks, you're not sleeping at all, and you really feel like it's impacting on your day-to-day -day life? Do you seek help from your GP? Um, and even when we're experiencing stress and can't do a lot about it, we can do things that will um, balance negative impacts of stress and reduce our, our production of stress hormones. So I've just listed here some really proactive ways we can combat stress. So exercise is probably number one. Um, exercise burns up cortisol and adrenaline, helping us to feel more calm and relaxed. So if we're constantly in this um, cycle of feeling stressed, producing stress hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, we feel we're in this real fight and flight state. Um, exercise is a real opportunity to get out and use physical movement to use up those hormones, the, the stress hormones, and actually make us feel more calm and relaxed. Um, we also, when we exercise, especially if we're doing something we enjoy when we exercise, we produce endorphins, which um, block the, the negative effects of stress hormone. Um, avoiding excess caffeine. So um, caffeine stimulates the release of adrenaline um, that makes us feel more stressed. So if we're already in this kind of like highly stressed mode, um, having a coffee is probably the wrong thing to do. Um, I would say reduce your intake of coffee to maybe a maximum of two a day. And, uh, you know, beyond that, maybe try and introduce like caffeine free versions of coffee, tea or introducing herbal teas instead. Um, find a stress relief activity that works for you. So it's, as I said, it has to work for you. So it's something that's very personal. You know, some people love like doing a mindfulness meditation um, gardening is a really big one that a lot of people find um, helpful. And I know a lot of people turn to in during the earlier first lockdown. Um, actually spending time in nature, but having your hands in the dirt is actually scientifically proven to bring down your cortisol levels, so it actually can reduce the, the, those stress hormone levels. Um, crafts, like doing jigsaws, knitting, all clinically proven to bring down levels of stress. Having a bath with lavender, um, having massage or reflexology, those kind of holistic therapies when they're available again, all really positive ways to bring down those levels of stress hormones in the body. Um, there's obviously the stresses that we can't avoid, but also do recognize in your lifestyle the stresses that you can. So what are those ones that you can cut out? Does social media leave you feeling really negative You know, after you've been scrolling for an hour? Does everyone else's life seem better than yours? Um, at the minute, the news is so negative, so maybe just reduce the amount that you're actually kind of um, keying into the news and listening to the news, maybe turn off the radio and listen to music more. Um, scary movies at bedtime, you know, the, the body doesn't realize the difference between the stress from a scary movie and, and real stress um, because it will still cause your adrenaline and your, your cortisol levels to shoot up. Um, 
spending time in nature, so getting outside, is also clinically proven to bring down our cortisol levels. So comparing going for a walk through like an urban city area and going for a walk in like a wood or a park, we know that going for a walk in like nature is really, really positive in bringing down cortisol levels. So just really easy ways. And it's only like a 10, 20 minute walk. Well, you'll, you'll reap the benefits. And as I said before, even when so much feels like it's out of our control, if we can focus on these things that you can, um, and we can all do these like small things to reduce stress, if we kind of add a few of these all together, the whole, you know, becomes greater than the sum of the parts and we can really make a big difference to the, to the impact of stress on our body. So I wanted to talk a little bit about lockdown insomnia, another way that stress has impacted our lifestyles during lockdown. Um, during the pandemic, the number of people who report sleep loss has increased from one in six to one in four. Um, stress and worry is a major cause of these poor sleep patterns but it could also be because of a lack of routine. Um, we might be working from our bedrooms now, so we associate them with work or keep our laptops in our bedroom. Um, and also increased alcohol um, intake could be another factor contributing to um, insomnia. And the reason I wanted to focus in on the, the role of insomnia and talk about how sleep is important is because in my opinion, sleep and a really healthy sleep pattern is one of the most important things we can do to promote our reproductive health. Um, and essentially it's free. <laughs> so, you know, we're all spending a lot of money on wellness and supplements, etc. But if you think about it, working towards a good sleep pattern um, is one of the most positive ways we can impact fertility and it doesn't cost us a penny. Um, so sleeping um, and the sleep hormone melatonin is increasingly understood to play a fundamental role in our reproductive health. Again, these more advanced fertility clinics that are in the States, some of them actually give melatonin in supplement form. Um, as I mentioned that, I just want to just have a little bit of a caveat. Um, some people actually then would go ahead and buy melatonin online from the States and try and self-supplement. I don't advise that. It can actually be quite dangerous. Um, you don't know what dose you need. You won't be having the proper support. Instead, I really encourage people to focus on getting natural melatonin production from a health sleep pattern. Um, melatonin is the hormone that regulates our sleep cycle and it's produced in the pineal gland in our brain. Um, and just a bit of an idea about how our sleep patterns have really changed um, over the last sort of like 60, 70 years. In 1942, less than 8% of the population were trying to survive on six hours or less sleep a night. And in 2019, almost 50% of the population is. So our our, our sleep patterns have really changed over the last 70, 80 years. And just for a bit of an idea about how that could impact our reproductive health, people who sleep less than six hours could reduce, reduce their chances of conceiving by half. So melatonin, what's its role in reproductive health? So again, this is an area that's getting a lot of attention um, for clinical research. So we've got a lot of good evidence um, and we're developing a really good understanding of why melatonin is important for our fertility. Um, women who work shifts, um, who work nights, often experience menstrual irregularity. So we know that working nights can actually impact our, our reproductive balance. And women's bodies actually store melatonin in the follicular fluid. So when you do with these, do these, do these, do these clinical trials, um, they actually find melatonin molecules in the follicular fluid. So our body never really does anything by accident. If the body is storing um melatonin in the fluid that surrounds follicles, it means it's needed there. It means melatonin has a really important role in follicular health. Um, granulosa cells that develop um, have um, melatonin receptors, means that they have a receptor on their cell wall um, for melatonin to like lock in. So it's a really good sign that melatonin has a role in the development of the granulosa cells um, when we're during our during our female cycle. Um, we know that men who sleep too little have a sperm count 29% lower than those who have a proper, proper sleep pattern. Um, and the, the research also indicates from animal studies that by reducing melatonin exposure, so that's by, um, you know, with animal studies, they would just leave the lights on all night. Um, fertility rates in these animals were reduced by half. Um, and for men, sleep is really important because testosterone is replenished during sleep. So the testosterone that's used up during the day is actually replaced 
So um, very, very important for male reproductive health to have a really good healthy sleep pattern. Um, and why is melatonin so important? So going back to how we talked about um, uh, alcohol producing free radicals, which is damaging to um, DNA, especially in egg and sperm cells. Melatonin is an antioxidant, which is a type of nutrient that protects cells from damage from free radicals. And it is, melatonin is actually one of the most powerful antioxidants that our body has. So it really plays a really important role in protecting egg and sperm cells from free radical damage. Um, not only is it its own antioxidant, it actually enhances the action of other antioxidants that we might get from our diet. Um, melatonin stabilizes our DNA. And as I said previously, conception is essentially the combining of DNA. And DNA stability is really important in ensuring that conception and this combining of the DNA from the sperm and the egg actually happens effectively. So it has a really, really key role in this stage of conception. So how do we improve sleep pattern during lockdown? Um, and just to focus on a possible positive of, of lockdown is can we stay in bed any later than usual if you don't have a commute? You know, are there some of us who usually spend an hour, an hour and a half commuting, you know, five times a week? Um, and maybe we're getting up after six hours sleep because of that. You know, does the, the lack of commute and working from home maybe mean that you can actually get a better sleep pattern, maybe edge up to like seven hours sleep at least? to really get the benefits of a healthy sleep pattern. Um, our bodies and brains also love routine. So sticking to your regular sleep routine, where we go to bed at the same time every day, um, and we get up at the same time the next morning, um, is a really good way to get a healthy, proper sleep pattern. Um, and you know our bodies have a body clock. So if we can feed this kind of very strong routine into the body clock, you'll find your sleep pattern um, really, really improves. Um, and there's something called sleep hygiene, which is sort of these changes that we can make to our environment that help us to sleep better. Um, so it's about avoiding blue light in the bedroom. So unlike this couple, not bringing your smartphone, your tablets um, into the bedroom, maybe just reading a book with a lamp, because the light that is emitted from these devices is actually quite bad for mel blocks melatonin release. Um, and melatonin release at night is dependent on complete shutdown during the day. So at night, um, for melatonin release, we need complete darkness. We need dark bedrooms. We want to avoid the blue light from like uh, devices, but also we need to shut down production completely during the day. So getting out into natural light is really important. So even if that is getting out for 10 minutes of a walk at lunchtime or first thing in the morning going outside into the bright light, that natural bright light actually shuts down the melatonin during the day, which actually then um, is very positive for its release later on. So getting out during lunchtime or at, at some point in the day trying to get out in sunlight is actually really positive for our sleep pattern. And um, I've, I've named this slide Netflix, the enemy of sleep, because a few years ago I read an interview with um, the guy who owns Netflix and, you know, the interviewer asked to him who he thought his main competition was. And he said his main competition was sleep in that he was trying to make TV that was so addictive that he would be interfering with people's sleep patterns and people would stay up watching TV instead of going to bed. And I do think that's a big thing nowadays. And I guess a lot of us are watching more TV than ever. There's lots of box sets available. So you might find yourself, you know, watching an extra episode of a TV show instead of maybe going to bed even when you feel tired. And I think also it's really important to remember that, you know, we can all watch TV all day, every day now. You know, you can watch TV until two o'clock every morning. Whereas 25 years ago, you know, the TV stopped, you know, BBC, there was no more programs um, after 10 p.m. There wasn't much to do. So what did we do? We went to bed, read a book, um, and we didn't sort of stay up watching TV, interfering with a healthy sleep pattern. Um, and just a little bit of a kind of a trivial fact for you there. But humans are the only animal that actually forego sleep for an activity that isn't crucial to survival. So, you know, we can stay up to, you know, watch TV. We could be shopping online um, instead of actually going to bed when we're when we're tired and getting a proper sleep pattern. So that's just a little bit of an, an outline of how we can support sleep and why sleep is important. Um, just to finish up, I wanted to just quickly address um, how we could possibly look after our immune health during um, the pandemic, especially as um, guidelines at the moment 
or that anyone undergoing fertility treatment or waiting for fertility treatment should not take the, the COVID-19 vaccine. So I wanted to look at ways that we could actually um, potentially support health nutritionally and support immune health nutritionally if you're choosing not to get the vaccine. I know some there's some information coming through from the World Health Organization that they might be changing that approach. But as I said, as, as it stands at the moment, that's that's the that's the policy. So I want to look at like uh, nutritional ways that we could support immune health for those not taking the vaccine. And I wanted to key in especially on the role of the nutrients, vitamin D, zinc, um, probiotics, and your diet. Um, just to stress. Um, anything that I'm talking about today in terms of nutritional ways that we can support the immune health are not designed to take place of the vaccine. They um, don't take place of public health recommendations like social distancing and um, face coverings and hand washing is still really important, but they're just ways that we can maybe make sure that our immune health, our immune system is in tip top condition um, during, during the pandemic. Um, when I was just the next day after I'd written the slide, I saw like a, a video that went viral on social media of like a family that were trying to check someone out of like um, the hospital saying that they were going to take treat him at home with vitamin D and zinc and vitamin C. And I thought, okay, I definitely have to clarify this does not take the place of conventional treatment, but it's just ways that we can make sure our immune system is as strong as it potentially could be. Um, so vitamin D, there is a huge amount of strong research suggesting that a low vitamin D status is a risk factor for severity of COVID symptoms. Um, low vitamin D can also have a negative role in our reproductive health. So by supporting our vitamin D levels, we're supporting immune health and reproductive health. So that's why, you know, nutritional health is so um, key because we never really just support one area of the body. We're often looking after our, the balance of our whole health um, and helping the health of various body systems. Um, vitamin D optimizes immune function and helps our immune system to combat the virus more effectively. Um, vitamin D deficiency is really common in the UK, especially the further north you go. Um, so Northern Ireland, Scotland, Northern England, um, vitamin D deficiency will be more common in those areas because um, the further north you go, obviously, there's less sunlight um, during the year. Um, for anyone who is um, sort of suspects they may be vitamin D deficient, I always recommend testing your vitamin D status and then supplementing accordingly, instead of just picking a, a vitamin D supplement off the, the shelf and hoping for the best. Um, there's a company called Better You that produce um, vitamin D supplements. And they produce vitamin D supplements in like a little spray form. And on their company website, they run a really fantastic service where you can order a vitamin D testing kit, have your levels checked, and then they will send you the right supplement that would then correspond. So you know you're actually on the right dosage of vitamin D um, depending on what you, where you're at in terms of your vitamin D status. Um, whereas zinc is another um, nutrient that optimizes immune function. Um, and the way that zinc is really important in combating viruses and COVID is because zinc increases activity of something called interferon. Interferon is a type of immune cell which interferes. So that's where the name comes from, interferon. It interferes with the activity of viruses. So it's really, really important to make sure you're um, getting enough zinc in the diet um, and supplementing with zinc um, if you're really trying to optimize your immune function. Um, vegetarian and vegan diets can often be low in zinc. So it's very important to be aware that you might be, if you follow vegetarian or vegan um, diets, you might not be getting as much zinc as someone who regularly eats meat. Um, but one real positive is that zinc is also really important for male and female fertility. So if you're taking a good quality um, fertility multivitamin, um, any of the multivitamins that are, are designed to enhance our reproductive health, you should be getting a good zinc level from your multivitamin. So have a little look at something that you're taking. There's a good chance that you're already getting a good level of zinc from that. Um, in terms of dietary sources of zinc, um, Red meat is very good, um, so good quality red meat once or twice a week. I would recommend um, eggs are suitable for your vegetarians and a good source of zinc. And for vegans, pumpkin seeds are good as well. But just be aware, vegans and vegetarians should be very aware that they'll be getting less from their diet. 
um, and probiotic bacteria. So probiotics is kind of a real emerging area of health where we're starting to understand that the good bacteria that live in our gut can have very significant impacts on our health and various areas of our health. And actually in about sort of the last two years or so, there's been a lot of really good research that probiotics are really important for um, fertility as well, especially women with PCOS. Um, but our immune system, 75% um, of our immune system actually is in our gut. And we know that probiotics are very, very important for enhancing that immunity. Um, research has recently come through from Korea that suggests that having, having a healthy population of good, ba good gut bacteria could have a positive impact on severity of COVID symptoms. So a way to enhance your levels of good bacteria in your gut is eating fermented foods, which have become really trendy at the moment, like sauerkraut, um, kefir, kombucha, trying to incorporate those in the diet is really fantastic. Um, or if you've had a history of IBS, digestive trouble, or a, a real history of using a lot of antibiotics, you might benefit from maybe trying a probiotic supplement um, just to really enhance um, levels of gut bacteria and, and support immunity. Um, and your diet can also help. Um, a diet rich in a form of nutrients called antioxidants. And as I mentioned earlier, antioxidants are really protective for our, our um, DNA. So those are the nutrients that um, block the action of free radicals that can damage the DNA of our um, sperm and egg cells in our reproductive system. They're probably, antioxidants are probably the most important type of nutrients to be incorporating into the diet um, when we're trying to conceive. What's also really interesting is that they also protect our immune cells. So by increasing the antioxidant intake of our diet, we support reproductive health and our immunity as well. Um, as I mentioned, melatonin, even though it's produced in the body, that's a natural antioxidant, but we actually have uh, can take in antioxidants from our diet. Um, antioxidants are found in all plant foods and they often give plant foods their bright color. Um, so aim to eat a rainbow of colors of fruits and vegetables. And um, just to kind of focus on a few really high um, antioxidant content foods, that we should be incorporating into our diet on a regular basis. Olive oil, especially extra virgin olive oil, drizzled over salads or vegetables, is a really, really key antioxidant. Dark chocolate. So, you know, even when I mentioned, you know, avoiding sugar um, in nutrition, there's an exception to absolutely every rule, and dark chocolate is the exception. Um, a really high cocoa content chocolate of like 75%, 80% cocoa, which is lower in sugar. Um, is a real great source of antioxidants that can re um, promote um, reproductive health and look after our immune system as well. Um, tomatoes and peppers, these brightly colored vegetables are really um, rich in antioxidants. Um, green tea and rooibos tea, another source. So even swapping your normal tea for those teas can have a real positive impact on our diet. Um, pomegranates and berries, again, those brightly colored pink purple berries are lovely source of antioxidants and all spices. So coming back to where I recommended eating tagines, curries, um, salsas, those kind of foods, um, getting as much of any spice, turmeric, ginger, cumin into the diet as possible is a really, really important way um, to increase our antioxidant intake and quite an easy way to do it sort of on a regular basis. So just wanted to recap there, that's how we can support our immune health if we're choosing not to, to go ahead and take the COVID vaccine. And I just wanted to put up this slide because I just wanted to help you see that, you know, how we can end up in a bit of a vicious cycle of negative habits during lockdown. We might have a stressful day and then we eat badly because we comfort eat and then we have a bad sleep because we're stressed, but also because we've eaten badly. And then the next day we feel so tired that we skip exercising. And then because we don't exercise, we're not getting rid of all the stress hormones. We've had a stressful day. But, you know, if you think about it, you know, that cycle is relatively easy to break, you know, even by just doing little tiny things. So, you know, even going out for a half hour walk, we reduce the levels of stress that we might have. So maybe we feel like we eat better and, you know, we've reduced stress levels so we sleep better. And then the next day, our energy levels are better. So we maybe exercise, um, you know, having a bath of lavender, we break the stress cycle, we reduce stress hormone levels. Um, you know, eating a little bit better might lead to better sleep. So all these tiny little things that we could do, um, as I said, you know, when you add them together, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So, you know, taking little tiny things that we've talked about tonight, 
and trying to put them together um, can make big changes and, and break this kind of vicious cycle of stress. And just to recap what I thought of as like the positives of lockdown, um, you know, and as I said, you know, there's a lot of things that are out of our control, but there are some things that are inside our control at the moment and, and to focus on those is really, really positive. Um, so you've got no commute. Do you have an extra hour here or there that you can then give over to the you know, time that you feel like you've never had? Exercise, stress management hobby, or even getting a better sleep pattern. And as I said, you're in control of your environment and in controlling your own environment is a real positive for habit change. It's one of the big things that can actually really promote healthy habit change. You know, so whenever you're in your work environment, you don't control the food environment there very well. You don't control what you can buy. You don't control the, the food that's around you, but at home you can do that. At home you can make sure that there's no sugar or biscuits or cakes in the house. You can make sure that all the healthy food is there in the, in the, in the fridge um, for you to eat. So you can get rid of that temptation. Um, and I said no socialising, as much as it's a negative that can really promote our stress, it can help us to be able to reduce our alcohol intake without the social, social pressure that might push, push you to drink more alcohol. Um, and also it gives us time. And I know in terms of fertility treatment, time can be, you know, you feel like time is slipping away from you and your biological clock is ticking, but also sometimes having time of, to pause and focus on our diet and lifestyle is a real positive. Um, it takes three months for a man to produce new sperm and three months for a female egg to come to maturity. So if we focus on having a three month window where we're, where we're really, um, you know, pushing for lifestyle changes, exercising, sleeping better, eating better, you know, at the end of those three months, our chances of conceiving naturally or an assisted conception can actually improve. Um, so we might have, you know, a bit more time at the moment, maybe things have been put on hold. And yes, that's a negative, but could that also be a small positive in that it's giving you time to focus on yourself, your reproductive health, you know, change your diet and maybe add in, you know, some of your good nutritional supplements. So as I said, you know, there's a lot of negatives, but there are some small positives. And um, there's just, as I said tonight, I just want to focus on how we could maybe use these small positives to have some real positive impact and lasting impact on our reproductive health and fertility. Okay, so that's um, us for the slides. So we've got time for some questions now as well. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was brilliant, really informative and so detailed. I think I've definitely developed a sourdough addiction over lockdown. <laughs> it's all very validated now. Sourdough and avocado and eggs. Yeah. Um, so just before we jump into the q and A's, I'm really happy to say that later this month, so starting from uh, the 16th of February, two weeks time, we will be um, opening up a nutrition group. So that is a weekly meeting um it will be on tuesday nights around the same time as this webinar um so if you feel like you need a little bit of group motivation or a little bit of accountability or a bit of you know, a community to cheer you on a bit then do get in touch with us to join the spaces will be limited so we'll be opening up to 25 people that means that if you would like to join as a couple you can as long as you just share a screen so if you're interested in joining that, I'll put, put my um, details in the chat below so you can just email me to let me know that you'd like to join. Um, so on to the Q&As. Um, so how could someone possibly refer some patients or um, some of your resources to share with their patients with you, Sarah? Um, I guess just get in touch with me maybe on social media. Is it the slides from tonight? that they're wanting to share or um, just general resources. I mean, I have quite, there's quite a few of my previous webinars on the Fertility Network YouTube channel. Um, I think there's maybe two other webinars that I've done there. Um, but if you've got any questions, you can contact me directly on my email and I'll, I'll gladly share. Thank you. We'll also be recording this webinar and the recording will go up on our YouTube channel later this week. So um, just keep an eye out on our social media or our website for the link. Or if you're having a tough time finding it, just email me and I can send it to you once it's ready. Um, so the next question is for someone who's trying to limit their sugar intake. Um, this lady's husband does eat a lot of carbs. So is there a certain time frame before IVF that he might try to limit carbs to improve outcomes? 
he is French, so I doubt he'd make a long-term commitment to minimising cars. <laughs> Relatable. Um, I guess maybe that question came through like before, and I'm talking about that three-month window. So I know sometimes you don't know when fertility treatment is going to start, and sometimes you can get, you know, a letter or you know a phone call saying we want you to come in in two weeks' time. So it's sometimes difficult to know, you know, to time yourself and give yourself that three-month window to focus on fertility. Um, but um, as I said, you know, even if you were focusing on it for, yeah, as I said, I, I would do the three months, I think, to, to tell you anything lower than three months, because as I said, in that three month period, a man is producing um, sperm. So if you're focusing on a really, um, you know, a really keying in during that three month period to making the dietary changes um, that we've talked about, at the end of the three months, that sperm will be really healthy sperm. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think to do anything less than three months just might not be completely effective. Um, with the carb intake, I would say, you know, even focusing if it's someone who really loves their carbs and their bread and, and those kind of foods, even, you know, even not necessarily focusing on removing it completely, but reducing the quantity of the meal that is dominated by carbs. So I would always say, um, like, think of your plate like a clock and like a quarter of the plate should be covered by carbs and a quarter protein and then a half vegetables. So even just looking at those kind of that balance of the plate um, can make a big difference um, to sort of how, how negatively the carbs can impact the body. Um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit, um, Emily mentioned this course that we're going to be running and one of the weeks is going to be focusing in on, you know, how in more detail about how diet um, can can affect insulin balance and blood sugars. And um, we would look at things like that, like the balance of the plate. Um, but definitely, you know, cutting out the real refined sugars. If there's any sugar going into tea or coffee, that would have to go. But as I said, in terms of the carbs, it's about the amount of the meal, you know, that is dominated by carbs. So avoiding things like pasta, pizza, you know, where it's a very carb-based meat, risotto. Um, but as I said, if you know that element of meat is about a quarter of the volume of the meal, um, that can then help you achieve real balance. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is about sugar. What would you include in sugar? For example, fruits, natural sugars like coconut sugar or honey and baking. Would you include those in the sugar detox as well? Um, I would. If you really struggle with sugar cravings, um, even the sweetness of honey or coconut sugar can drive you to then crave sugar again. So it can set you off on the sugar cycle because it still kind of has that sweetness. And even though they are healthier, um, something like honey and coconut sugar, they can still have an impact on your blood sugar that can set you off in this kind of like sugar addiction cycle. Some of us are, are more sensitive than others. And actually you might find at the end of like a 10 day sugar detox, you are less um, sensitive to this kind of like sugar cycle you can actually you know have some honey over your yogurt or have something baked and it doesn't set you off in the addiction but when you're kind of in the middle of the sugar addiction even those kind of not more natural sugars will set you off what i would say is if you do try to do like a sugar detox um whenever i've done it in the past with myself and i do it with clients i would even cut out things like honey and coconut sugar but i do allow fruit um so maybe two pieces of fresh fruit daily um, and maybe even focusing on the lower sugar fruits like um, berries and kiwi or citrus um, and avoiding um, like things like mango and bananas, pineapple, which might be just a little bit sweeter um, and higher in sugar content. Um, it depends on everyone because you might, if you really are like in that real sugar addiction cycle, you know, it depends. Something a little small like that can set you off. But two pieces of fruit a day and ideally the lower, like the berries are fantastic, kiwi fruit, citrus, that would be my choice. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, is whole milk good for our fertility or better than other kinds of milk? Um, I tend to recommend organic milk. Um, I don't generally recommend completely cutting out dairy unless you have um, lactose intolerance or an a sensitivity to dairy protein. Um, some women, however, who maybe are struggling with like endometriosis or finding it hard to regulate their cycle, some women do find that cutting out milk um, can, 
can help those those conditions. So it, it really depends on the person. Um, but I generally would always recommend organic milk in moderation. Um, and then, as I said, if there's something underlying like a hormonal imbalance, possibly an estrogen dominant type condition, um, like endometriosis, you might benefit from cutting it out completely. Um, I said everyone's different. Um, okay. Uh, the next question is about the vaccine. So if you don't mind, I'll just jump in here. Um, so Ari, the vaccine, I thought the HFDA had updated this. So the advice is it's okay prior to conception. So yes, it's more about making an informed personal choice. Uh, last week, we did do a Q&A with HFDA and the British Fertility Society mm -hmm. that found um, on our social media and on the Fertility Network UK YouTube channel. And again, if you're having any trouble finding the link to that, just email me, you can find my email in the chat box. So um, the next question is, is the recording available afterwards? Yes, it will be. Um, okay, is homemade kombucha safe during conception and pregnancy? I would say no. Um, anything kind of fermented, I would make, um, I, would, I would buy, I purchase already made um, from an experienced company. So that's, that incur, includes kefir, kombucha, sauerkraut, um, I just think if you make it at home, um, you know, if you haven't sterilized the jar properly or, you know, you're not experienced, you can end up with some bacteria in there that could lead to a bug or, you know, um, and I personally would would not recommend that for someone trying to conceive or possibly pregnant. So, yeah, um, that's a really good question. And I, I don't um, I would purchase it from like a health store or a supermarket or a deli um, where, you know, it's been made by, by someone really experienced. Experience, so it's less likely to have, you know, mold or, or something in it that could possibly be creeping in there if you make it at home. Okay, so I think this is the final question. Um, you mentioned pasta. Are the lentil flour and black bean pastas any better than standard wheat pastas? Yes, definitely. That's a good question. Um, they would be my preferred go-to pastas um, because they're higher in protein and higher in fiber than your normal kind of pasta. So um, they release energy more slowly. So a great option instead of white pasta. They're fab for like, um, you know, pasta salads at lunchtime possibly, or even making a difference to your, you know, your pasta meals. Another way that you can also eat pasta in a way that's a bit more healthy for your blood sugar. Um, so it doesn't, it's less likely to cause spikes in blood sugar and insulin is to eat pasta cold. So whenever pasta is cooked and then cooled, it, um, it releases starch and this starch actually slows the release of your blood glucose um, after you've eaten the, the pasta. So um, like a pasta salad where the pasta has been cooked and cooled is actually going to have less of an impact on your blood sugar than if you're eating like a hot dish of pasta um, with like tomato sauce. Okay, um, so that's the end of the Q&A session. So thank you so much, Sarah, for that okay. presentation and for the questions. And also thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening. Thank you for your time. Um, if you would like to know more about the nutrition course, then just get in touch via email. Uh, the recording will be available afterwards as well. So um, if anyone does want to get in touch with Sarah directly, then the best place to find her is probably on social media. That's tagged across our social media as well. So if you look for Fertility Network UK on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we've tagged Sarah in any post relating to this webinar. Um, so I think we'll leave it there. Thank you everyone for joining us. And if you need any support, please get in touch with Fertility Network. We have support line, support groups, and Zoom this nutrition group, which we're really excited about. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.